morning, everyone. Uh, I am Suresh Subramani, uh, the Global Director for the Tata Institute for Genetics and Society. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the sixth seminar in our series, Science Serving Society. We have a very exciting talk today on mapping the genome of Anopheles Stevens I to create what we think is a gold standard reference genome. And the ind individual scientists who are involved in uh, in this work are here today. Uh, the first of these is Dr. Mahul Chakravarti, who is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of California, Irvine. Just by way of background, he did his master's degree in biotechnology from IIT Roorkee, uh, where he graduated at the top of his class. And then he did his PhD work on Drosophila melanogaster, working on evolutionary genetics with Dr. James Fry at the University of Rochester. And after that, he moved to UC Irvine, where he's working in the lab of Dr. J.J. Emerson, uh, studying the evolution of uh, fruit flies, mosquitoes, and butterflies. Uh, the, Dr. Chakravarti uh, is, uh, has been recognized in a number of different ways. He has his own independent uh, NIH grant called Pathway to Independence Award from the National Institute of Health in the United States. He's also an awardee uh, of the DeLille Nasser Award from the Genetic Society of America. Uh, in addition to his science, which he's very passionate about and his love for insects, he's also actively involved in India with an NGO called uh, Pratyush in his hometown where he tries to get young people interested in science and particularly getting young underprivileged uh, children excited about science. So he will actually lead off the presentation, but we will have a panel discussion at the end with another scientist who's contributed equally to the work that has been published in February in BMC Biology. And this is Dr. Arunachalam Ramaya, who is a senior scientist at the Tata Institute for Genetics and Society in Bangalore. Uh, Dr. Ramaya received his PhD in bioinformatics from Manon Manian uh, Sundar Nar University in Tirunaveli in uh, India. And also at the same time, he did his, be part of his PhD work uh, in Finland at the Abo Academy University in Finland. So just before joining TIGS as a senior scientist, he worked in a number of different institutions, uh, starting with the Indian Institute of Science in, in Bangalore and then at the Center for Disease Control and Prevention in the United States at Stanford University. And then he was in the same lab as uh, Dr. Mahul Chakravarti at the University of California, Irvine. Uh, Dr. Ramaya's interests are in studying genome and structural variation in mosquitoes and fruit flies, and the nature of the interactions of these arthropods with the bacterial endosymbionts that they have primarily in their gut. Uh, he uh, received, uh, among awards, the prestige, prestigious ISID New Investigator Award from the International Society for Infectious Diseases in the United States for his work on T-cell epitopes uh, and their evolution in mycobacterium tuberculosis. So with this, uh, I will now turn the podium uh, to uh, Mahul. Mahul, if you could start sharing your slides and go through your presentation, and then at the end, we'll come back for a panel discussion that will also involve our room. Okay, thank you, Suresh. So today, um, I will talk about uh, how we assembled the Anopheles Stephensi reference genome that Suresh just mentioned. And in doing that, I'll first give a broader context of it so that uh, the implications of this reference genome becomes clearer for vector and based biology research in the world and especially for India. So India is home of diverse animals and plants and the vector species that we find here are similarly diverse. For example, we have Anopheles, um, Anopheles stephensi for here shown here as vector of malaria parasite plasmodium we have Aedes aegypti, which acts as a vector for diseases like dengue and chikungunya. We have Culex kinkifichiaris, which acts as a vector for filaria and West Nile fever. We have um, Mansonia mosquitoes, which also act as vectors of lymphatic filaria. We have sand flies, which uh, are vectors for um, diseases like um, leishmaniasis. And then we have ticks, which also spreads viral fevers. Now to control uh, these vectors sustainably and effectively, we need a high quality reference genome. 
Why? Because whether you're studying a single gene or multiple gene, as in functional genomics, or whether you are studying genetic variation to understand the ecology of the species or adaptation in it, or you are simply looking at the repeat content or how the genome uh, functions, you need reference genome for all of these. So how do we get a reference genome? Because the species that I just mentioned about are, and other vector species that we find in India, for most of them, we don't have a reference genome. One popular approach to get or to build a reference genome is the shotgun approach, or it's in, in short, it's called the whole genome shotgun approach or WGS approach. It goes like this. So you start with a genome and then you fragment it into smaller pieces. And then you sequence individual pieces into small reads or DNA sequences. Now you got small reads that came from a really long stretch of DNA that spanned the entire chromosome. So how do we go from these small DNA pieces to the, G to the DNA that uh, stretches from the end to end of the chromosome? And the process by which we do that is called genome assembly. And it goes like this. We start with read or two reads, for example, and then we look for unique overlaps between them. Now, as you saw in the last slide, there are lots of reads that are coming from the genome. And it's impossible for a human being to look through or sort through all those reads looking for overlaps like this. So we have computer programs for that specialized algorithms we call assembly algorithms. And they look for these overlaps. And when an overlap, a unique overlap is found between two reads, they're joined into what are called contigs. Now, this means that contigs have no gaps in them because they're entirely comprised of sequence from read one, then overlapping part, and then read two. And this way, the sequence gets expanded on both way, both, both sides. Now, at some point, you may find regions which cannot be spanned by any overlaps. For example, you have a contig like this and a contig like this, which don't have anything, no overlapping sequence. So what can we do? Well, sometimes what we can find is that there is linkage information or some information that informs that these two contexts are connected to each other in the genome or in the chromosome. And when we find that or a program finds that, what it does is it takes these two sequences and then it connects them, but it connects them in a specialized way. It leaves a bunch of ends instead of ATGC, which are present in the other parts of the sequences. And the sequence that you get from this process are called scaffolds. So now I should point out, uh, or you should uh, notice the difference between scaffolds and contigs that I just mentioned in the previous slide. That scaffolds have ends or gaps in them, whereas contigs have no gaps in them. Ideally, we would want a contig, a single contig, spanning the entire chromosome. But that does not really happen. Why? Because think of genome assembly as a jigsaw puzzle, like shown here. And just like a jigsaw puzzle, this mosquito's head has, or its body has a lot of unique pieces and they are easy to put together. Now, as we move towards the skin, this part is highly redundant and the pieces don't look so unique. Now, this part actually is more like repetitive parts of the genome. And just like here, re repetitive parts of the genome are difficult to assemble. Why? Because when you have the reads that are shorter than the repeat units, you, you don't have the unique overlap that you need to connect the reads. And that leaves gaps in those genomic regions. Now, the very first genome that was assembled with the whole genome shotgun approach was the Drosophila genome that was published in 2000. The next year, the human genome was published. Actually, 
The Drosophila genome was used as a pilot project for the human genome. However, these genomes are not complete yet. They're still being improved upon. Two years after the Drosophila genome was published, the first vector genome was sequenced and assembled, and that was Anopheles gambi. However, the genome was far from complete. Why? Let's take a look. The Anopheles gambi genome assembly had five major scaffolds representing five chromosome arms. X, 2R, which is the right arm of the chromosome 2, 2L, which is the left arm of chromosome 2, 3R, which is the right arm of chromosome 3, and then 3L, which is the left arm of the chromosome 3. Among these, 2R is the largest and is represented by a 61.5 million base pair sca scaffold in the assembly. However, just like the saying, all that glitter is not gold goes, this scaffold is not what it seems like. So this is a schematic of the 2R. And what I have done here is I have placed a vertical line everywhere there is a gap in their scaffold. And you can see that there are 1,658 gaps in just chromosome 2R alone. And these gaps increase in density as we move from left towards right. Why? Because the centromere of the chromosome 2 is on this side. And the number of repeats or the repeat density increases near centromere. And that's why the number of gaps also increase. Now, you might be wondering what are in these gaps? Why do we care? Well, the gaps often contain functional sequences. And to show what kind of functional sequences, I have zoomed into one of them. And you can see here that this particular region that I have zoomed into contains a gene called neuropeptide Y receptor Y2. In green, I have the 5 prime UTR. Then in blue, I have the coding sequence, the protein coding sequence. And in orange, I have the 3 prime UTR. The vertical lines, vertical dotted lines here represent the exact positions where the gaps are present. And one of the gaps actually falls at the boundary of the coding sequence. And when we zoom into that, we can see that there is a bunch of ends in there. Now, if you are studying the function of this gene, you are stuck because you don't know what's in here. And this situation is present in other chromosome arms as well. And you can see here that 2R, 2L, 3R, 3L all contain gaps and chromosome X particularly has even greater number of gaps. It's, see, even though it's smaller, the number of gap it has is almost equal to the bigger arms. Why? Because chromosome X has more repeats, number one. Number two is it also has lower coverage because it's present in one copy in males, whereas the other chromosomes are present in two copies in, uh, uh, in females and the, the auto and, and, and males both. Notably, there is no Y chromosome in the assembly because the Y chromosome is highly repetitive and therefore has, have not been assembled in this particular, um, uh, for this particular genome. So that misses an opportunity of studying the Y chromosome. We'll get back to that when we present our Anopheles defense genome. Now, looking at these vertical lines are good for figuring out where the gaps are but they become cumbersome when you are trying to compare contiguity or fragmentation between two different assemblies or even more assemblies. For that, we use a summary plot called a contiguity plot. Let me explain what this contiguity plot is and how to interpret it. <clears throat> so on a contiguity plot, on the x-axis, we have the contig lengths ranked from the longest on the left and towards shortest on the right. And on the y-axis, we have the cumulative contig size expressed as proportion of total assembly size. Now, you might ask why proportion and not total assembly size? Because the genomes we are going to, com going to compare may have different sizes. Therefore, it's 
better or is more meaningful to present them as proportions rather than the absolute genome size. Now here I'm presenting Anopheles gambi genome and Drosophila melanogaster ISO1. Now the Drosophila melanogaster ISO1 is the Drosophila melanogaster reference genome, which is often considered the gold standard genome assembly for multicellular organisms. And as this line indicates, as you move from towards the left side of the plot, the assembly becomes more contiguous or better. As you move towards right, the assembly becomes more fragmented or worse. As the Anopheles Gambi line indicates, and as you have seen in the previous slide, this assembly is very, very fragmented and much worse than the, Anoph and than the Drosophila melanogaster reference genome. In five years after the Anopheles Gambi genome came out, the Addis Egypti genome was sequenced in 2007. And around the same time, the Illumina short reads uh, started to uh, be become used. In 2010, that is three years after Addis Egypti genome was sequenced, the QLEX Quincapiciatus genome was sequenced as, as a third muscular genome. Now, because these genomes were sequenced nearly five and uh, eight years after the Anopheles Gambi genome, we would think or we would expect that these genomes will be better than the Anopheles Gambi genome in contiguity. Let's see. Now, this is our contiguity plot. And in green, we have the Anopheles Gambi. And in orange, we have the Aedes aegypti. And in blue, we have the Culex quincaficiatus. And as this uh, plot indicates, both of these genomes, new genomes, were significantly more fragmented or much worse than the Gambi assembly and far, far uh, away from the line that represents the uh, standard that we are trying to achieve. So how can we go from here to here? Let's go back to the analogy that I was using before, the jigsaw puzzle analogy. Now, in G if you have solved jigsaw puzzle, you know that if the size of the pieces increase, that it becomes easier to solve the puzzle. Now in assembly world, that would mean that if we increase the length of the reads, then it would make our life easier for assembling genomes, especially of the repeated regions. Now, where can we find these long reads? In 2012, nearly two years after the QLEX genome was published, Pacific Biosciences announced that their reads could reach up to 2 kb. However, these reads had nearly 30% error rate. So they were only 60% accurate, 70% uh, accurate. That means that they were pretty noisy. But despite the noisiness, the assembly theory suggests that you can use these reads to assemble genomes. Coincidentally, around the same time, Anopheles stephensi was detected in Eastern Africa, in Djibouti. And why is that important? That is important because Stephen Tsai was previously found in South Asia. And its detection in Eastern Africa meant that it was spreading in a different, in a new continent. And on top of that, the populations of Anopheles Stephen Tsai in India and in other parts of Asia and in the new populations in Africa were reporting high incidence of insecticide resistance. So to counter all these, we needed a genomic resource for Anopheles stephensi. So a group decided to sequence the Anopheles stephensi genome. And they did it in 2014, two years after the Pacific Biosciences long readers, long readers were, were announced. So they used both Pacific Biosciences long reads and Illumina short reads to assemble the genome. Now, just to point out around the same time, Another long read technology that Oxford Nanopore long reads also became available, but this genome was uh, assembled with only PAC bio long reads or Illumina and Illumina short reads. Now let's see how this genome looks like in comparison to the genomes, mosquito genomes that were already existing. Now this is again our contiguity plot. These two are the Edis and Culex genomes that were available before. 
Now, this is Anopheles Stephen's genome that was just sequenced in 2014. And this is the Gambi genome that was sequenced in 2002. So this is slightly disappointing because it was sequenced almost 12 years after the Gambi genome was sequenced and still it was worse in terms of contiguity than the Gambi assembly. Now, then how can we assemble uh, how can we really get to that Drosophila melanogaster like assembly? Well, you can say, and this is in, becomes more intuitive that, well, you, can we make the pieces a little bigger like this in the right uh, jigsaw puzzle? It turns out that we can, and PacBio's reads became a little longer, but they still had noise. So people were hesitant to use it again because most uh, genomes that were assembled with pack bio noisy reads were turning out to be really bad. So we came up with some strategy and published a paper in 2016 where we um, showed how could we leverage the noisy long reads to get really high quality assemblies. And it went like this. We, you start with your favorite animal or organism. You collect high molecular weight genomic DNA, then share them or not share them depending on whether you're using Pacific Biosciences long reads or Oxford Nanopore. You create the long read library, sequence them, and then you assemble them with different assemblers like Canoe, Falcon. Uh, there are more modern assemblers like Fi, Hi-Fi, uh, ASM, and all those things. And then you can use this meta assembly tool called Quick March that I wrote and combine all those assemblies into generate a final assembly. Now, you may not always have long reads because long reads can be expensive. So you can supplement your long reads with uh, short reads that are cheaper. And you can do it this way. So we can partition your uh, DNA in two. You can get some long reads and you can get some short reads and then you can combine the long reads and the short reads using a different software, a generate hybrid assembly. And then just like other assemblies, you can combine the information of this assembly with your other PacBio assembly using the meta assembler to generate the final assembly. Now we took this approach and we applied to the Drosophila melanogaster strain, not the reference strain. This time we have used a strain called A4. It's different from uh, the reference genome and will have genetic variation compared to the reference genome. Let's see how this genome looks like on the contiguity plot. Now, these lines I have already shown you, these, called, these have the Gambi, the older Stephens I genome, older, older ADIS and Culex genomes. And this is what the A4 genome is. And this is the Drosophila melanogaster reference genome. So for the very first time, we have an insect genome assembly that achieved the same contiguity, in fact, surpassed the contiguity of the Drosophila melanogaster reference genome. Now, you might ask, why do we care about this highly contiguous genome assembly? I told you that we sequenced a strain that's different from the reference genome. So when we compare the Drosophila melanogaster reference genome and our strain A4, we can find differences in our genetic variation between them. Now, we also tried to find the same genetic variation using Illumina short reads. And when we do that, what we find is that mutations that resulted from inversions or gene duplications or transposable element insertions are simply non repetitive in insertion deletions are missed at a high, high rate by short read uh, based methods, as shown by this lighter color. Uh, proportions here. Now, so again, this timeline, we have the Drosophila melanogaster A4, which was published in 2018, that achieved the standard of the Drosophila melanogaster reference genome. Now, in the same year, uh, Aedes aegypti genome was published, but that did not use the approach we uh, were using. And let's see how did the Edis aegypti, which is currently the, or is, is the uh, latest version of Edis aegypti genome, looked like on the contiguity plot. 
Now, this is A4 and the, IS, uh, the reference genome, Drosophila melanogaster reference genome. These are the three mosquito genomes that were sequenced with the older technologies. And this is the Aedes aegypti genome. Now, this is clearly much improved than it was before. And Aedes aegypti genome is harder to assemble because it's much larger than uh, Anopheles and Drosophila genomes. But still, it's not quite there in, uh, in the same ballpark as Drosophila melanogaster genome. So the genome is improved, but it's still fragmented. So at this time, we decided um, to join forces with uh, you, uh, the TIGs, you have a scientist from UCSD, UC Irvine, and IBAB to build a genome of Drosoph uh, Anopheles stephensi using the methods that we learned from Drosophila. And to do that, we started by like this. So we sequenced a bunch of PacBio long reads from Irvine and a bunch of long reads from India. And then we com combined them and got 42 billion best pairs of Pacific Biosciences long reads. We assembled them using a software called Falcon, which is really good at assembling heterozygous, heterozygous sequences. And we use Canu, which is another excellent assembler. And then we took these two assemblies and merged their information to generate the final set of contigs using quick merge. And how did this look like, or how does it look like? This is the contiguity map, and this is all other mosquito assemblies that were before Anopheles Stephens I was assembled. And this is where the A4 and refer Drosophila melanogaster reference genome joins Anopheles Stephens I. So yes, this is the very first time a mosquito genome achieves the standard of the Drosophila melanogaster or the, one of the best genome assembly in the world. Now, we did not want to stop there. Remember, I told you that after we get the context, we can improve it even further by building scaffolds. And for doing, for building scaffolds for Anopheles Stephensi, we used a technology called HiC. Now, what is HiC and how does it work? For HiC, we extract nucleus from the mosquitoes and then we cross-link DNA like shown here. Then we cut, cut the DNA with restriction enzymes. This way, DNA that are close together or they are the, the DNA that are in proximity with each other in the nucleus, they get cross-linked more often there than DNA that are away from them. Then we fill the ends and mark them with biotin. And in, uh, soon it will become clear why. And we ligate these uh, ends. And then we use the labels, biotin labels, to pull down the sequences. And at the end, we sequence them with uh, short read sequencing, like uh, Illumina uh, high throughput short reads. Now, how does this sequencing uh, data becomes something that we can use for scaffolding? Now, that happens because that contact frequency becomes a distance map, much somewhat like a recombination map. And it happens like this. So focus on this particular point. Now, this one is closer to this point on this chromosome than this point or this point. This, because these two points are closer to each other than these two points, they will show more contacts between them in a high C uh, data set than these two points. And this point will show even fewer contacts between them. And this is what it looks like when we use an actual high C plot. Now on the right, we have a high C plot for the Anopheles defense genome. And you can see here that we have just three scaffolds for this assembly representing the X, the second chromosome, and the third chromosome. And in the diagonal, we have the highest contact frequency because the contacts are highest, are most dense between adjacent sequences in the DNA. And they are 
less frequent when you move really away from the diagonal. For example, if you look at this point and this point, they have not much contact as indicated by this bluish color, which indicates fewer contacts. However, you still see a uh, little brighter colors indicating that there are some contacts which seem like not very close in the physical chromosome map. And that's because these parts of these parts of the chromosomes indicate the location of the centromeres. And in the nucleus, the centromeres tend to cluster together. Now, just to summarize how this assembly looks like in terms of some of the sta summary statistics, the contigen 50 are, um, is the sequence uh, such that 50% of the genome is contained within sequences of that length or longer is 38 megabits. For comparison, the Drosophila melanogaster reference genome has a contigen 50 of only 18 megabits or million base pairs. The scaffold N50 is 88.7 million base pairs, which is basically the length of the third chromosome. The Busco score is 99 for diptera is 99.2%. Busco is the number of unique ortholog orthologous genes that are present in all dipterans. And that is a really, really high number. The QV score is 49.2, which translates into an error rate of one error in 85,000 nucleotides in the assembly. That is also one of the lowest error rate in the assemblies that have been published so far in the whole world. So to update the timeline, we now have a, a genome assembly that's com comparable to the Drosophila melanogaster A4 and the Drosophila melanogaster reference genome. And to put it into a better perspective, I'll just show a, a figure from a recent paper that was submitted to the preprint bioarchive. Now, this, the authors of this paper, they took all the assemblies that exist for all insects and they plotted the assembly length on the x-axis and the contig N50, which summarizes the contiguity of the assembly on the y-axis. And you can see that the Anopheles stephensi is at the top of this plot. So why do we care? And what uh, did this highly contiguous assembly reveal? It showed us a bunch of new things. For example, it provided us a new uh, catalog of transposable elements, many genes that were not visible before, but involved in blood metabolism. We recovered a lot of Y-link sequences and therefore Y-link repeats and genes, many immunity genes that were not known before, and of course, a bunch of new insecticide resistance genes. Now, I'm not gonna have time to go over all of them in details. So if you want to know more in details uh, of, about all of them, please read our paper, but I'll, I will go over some of these topics briefly. The new assembly revealed a lot of new full-length TEs. And in fact, 30% of the TE nucleotides that we found in our assembly were not present in the previous assembly. And the, uh, the LTR retrotransposons were the, uh, uh, comprised more, the most of these missing TE bases, followed by the non-LTR retrotransposons and DNA um, elements. Now, this might not look a lot to you, but this is just for TE nucleotides. In fact, when we think of, the, when we consider full length TEs, this, this proportion becomes even greater and goes up to 85%. So only 15% 15 per, 15 of the LTR elements that we discovered with this assembly were either fragmented are missing in the previous assembly. And why is that important? Because TEs are important transgenic tools, number one. Number two is, and that is my favorite part, is that TEs are a huge part of genetic variation that are functionally important. And if we are missing TEs in the reference genome, 
we cannot map these Ts that are segregating in the population. The new assembly, unlike nearly all other mosquito assemblies, revealed a lot of Y chromosome sequences. In, we, in fact, we recovered 33 Y-linked contigs. And we did that by calculating density of male KMARs and female KMARs and comparing their ratios between the male, uh, between the Y-linked uh, sequences and the other sequences. And you can, as you see here in this plot, the Y-linked sequences cluster really nicely together and separately from the other contigs. Now, these Y-linked sequences revealed two things. They revealed seven new Y-linked genes, including a transcription factor gene. And they showed a surprisingly different TE landscape than the rest of the genome. And I'm going to show just this summary uh, plot to uh, give a broad overview of that uh, distinct T landscape of the Y. Now, this is autosome on the x-axis, the X chromosome and the Y chromosome. And on the Y axis, we have the percent of total TE that are occupied by different types of TE. Now, in autosome and in the X chromosome, they have a similar amount of uh, the non-LTR and the LTR, slightly more in X, but still comparable, and DNA elements. But in Y chromosome, they have nearly 90% of the genome, 90% of the repeats occupied by just LTR elements. Now, one thing that I have not shown here is that Y has its own TE elements. That means TE elements that are not found in any other chromosomes. That means these TEs are only present in males and not in females. That's in, in, interesting, right? Now, the new G assembly revealed also a bunch of new insecticide resistant candidate genes. And these include esterases, cytochrome P450 and cytochrome P450 oxygenases, and glutathione S transferases. Among these, the, the cytochrome P450s were the most abundant. 90, there were 94 total genes. And even though um, the number of missing genes among these classes of insecticide resistance genes are comparable, because the cytochrome P450s are more uh, numerous in the genome, they have more missing sequences in the earlier uh, version of the assembly. Now, apart from these insecticide resistance candidate genes, there are other genes that were fragmented or missing in the older assembly and we reconstructed. And this is uh, the knockdown resistance, which is famous because it, uh, there are amino acid polymorphisms in the genes which confer insecticide resistance in, in mosquitoes. Now, in orange, or, or in shades of orange, I have the contigs from the old assembly, which you can see are, there are several that spans the entire KDR gene. In our assembly, this is spanned by just one contig. So we have the entire gene reconstructed for the first time in our assembly for Anopheles defensi. And in, that allowed us to find all eight different isoform, isoforms of this gene. The other thing that this um, sequence showed us is that KDR is uh, generally studied by people for insecticide resistant polymorph amino acid polymorphisms. But what we found in the three prime end of the KDR is that there is an insertion um, in, in this gene. Now, because we sequence a deployed um, genome, there are two sets of chromosomes. Now, the assembly represents one set and there was another chromosome. Now, in in the bottom panel, what I'm showing you is the read coverage across this, this part of KDR. 
And you see here that the coverage drops to around half of what the coverage is here. And that's because there is an insertion in one chromosome, but the other chromosome does not have that insertion. And that insertion is a TE. Now you might ask, why do I care about a TE insertion in the three prime end of KDR? It's not present in the gene because TEs, when they insert in the vicinity or adjacent to any gene, they can silence the gene's uh, expression if by epigenetic means. And that can change the expression level of the gene. So even though this TE is not really inserted inside KDR, it can still modify its expression level. Now imagine if you did not have this genome and all you are looking for is the amino acid polymorphism in this gene using PCR, while this TE polymorphism inserted right next to it is contributing controlling its functional um, outcome. The one complex fe uh, feature of the of complex uh, genes that we uh, resolved are insecticide resistance clusters. This is one example of a uh, cytochrome P450 cluster. This, I'm calling it a cluster because it has a bunch of tandemly, uh, tandemly placed cytochrome P450 genes and in the old assembly, because of this tandem cluster, it was not resolved and was placed and was fragmented in four different contigs. In our assembly, this is present in just one uh, contig. And why is that important? Because it can, not only it gives us the entire sequence to look for insecticide resistant mutations in these genes by assaying genetic variation in natural populations, but it also tells us cool biology about insecticide resistance in, in mosquitoes. For example, on this top panel, I have plotted the isoseq coverage. Isoseq is a fancy name of reads that um, sequence the entire mRNA produced from these genes. And you, you can see here that some of these genes are expressed only in females, but not in males. So that means that these genes are involved in insecticide resistance only in females, not in males. With that, I will move uh, to what this assembly means uh, beyond anophilus sifensi. Now this assembly, as I just showed you, I hope I convinced you that it provides a benchmark for future genome assemblies that includes both mosquito genomes and uh, other genomes. In fact, you can substitute any species of your choice and it will apply to it. It provides a, a, a path towards mapping comprehensive genetic variation. How? Because we can now move from one reference genome to a population of reference genome to use insecticide resistance loci because insecticide resistance genes are often present in complex mutations in natural populations and in involving gene duplications and transposable element insertions. And of course, if you are using CRISPR to study genes or trying to uh, modify uh, any uh, population in the lab or outside, you definitely need to know the complete sequence of, of these genes. And finally, it provides a path towards high resolution functional genomics, uh, whether you're studying gene expression or you're studying epigenetics or, or uh, studying um, chromatic landscape. And in conclusion, I would uh, say that the long reach age of genomics is here. Why? Because the technology or the reads that we used for constructing the Anopheles Stephens reference genome are becoming obsolete. They're going away. They are actually being replaced by long reads that are highly accurate, more than 99% accurate. They're so accurate that they can be used to assemble a human genome in around six hours. And that is why we are expect and we will see more and more vector and base genomes uh, on the horizon and av available very soon, including, as I said, population samples of their reference genomes. With that, I'd like to thank uh, 
several people, uh, my mentor and my colleague, uh, JJ, and uh, Arun, who did a lot of heavy lifting for this project and was a, uh, an, a, an extremely important part of, of this genome project. Then Tony James, who uh, introduced me to uh, Anopheles Stephensi and taught me a lot about the Stephensi um, biology and did helped with us with um, inbreeding the mosquitoes. Then Dr. Subramani, who uh, was who brought the team together and managed the entire project from start to finish, and uh, Ethan and many others from TIGS India, TIGS UCSD, and IBAB, who um, are too many to name here, but you know who you are all. And of course, the funding by TIGS my, uh, from NIH. And if you want to learn, find more updates, you can follow me on Twitter. You want to find some software. You can go to my GitHub or for collaborations and questions, you can email me. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Mahul. Uh, you know, we asked Mahul to keep it simple for a lay audience, meaning that this was not uh, uh, sequencing experts necessarily. And he did a beautiful job in the sense that I use an analogy here. You have a beautiful piece of music or a, 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 a a poetry or, or even a wonderful novel in which a bunch of pages might have been snipped away or notes have been snipped away, which is what he called gaps in the genome. And what he's shown you is the whole book uh, uh, of Anopheles Stevens I now that the world can use. So I want to lead this off with a question for Arun. Uh, and Arun, as Mahul said, you contributed equally to this work and very important part of uh, uh, of the uh, collaborative work. And of course, Mahul has described uh, the contributions of both of you as well as the rest of the team. So can you tell the audience here a little bit about um, how this sequencing is going to be made available for other researchers in the field? So in other words, you know, there are about what, 15,000 genes or so in this genome, but how do other people access it? And can you say a little bit about how they go about uh, finding information about their favorite genes? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Sarish. Um, yeah, that uh, we actually collectively made a very important contribution to develop this uh, reference quality Anapolis genome. So before I start this position uh, in TICS, uh, Mahul has assembled this uh, genome uh, in the context level. And uh, so then uh, we had uh, collaborator to uh, make the uh, these contacts into the, the next level. So what I initially did, uh, the, I took the, the contacts and um, we scaffolded into the chromosome. So that means that's the end to end that include the centromere in, uh, in the middle as well. So we assembled the, the entire chromosome of X and chromosome two and three. And also we have assembled the 2.4 mahabases of white chromosomes. And then um, we took the effort to uh, annotate that one uh, first time using the isoseq data. So uh, when compared to the, the bacterial genome, that can be done in one or two days. But when you wanted to do that, in particularly in the vector, it's required a lot of effort and the time. So we have uh, blended or combined the two technology to annotate this um, Anopheles T-Pansite genome. So what initially we did that we took the, the isoseq uh, reads and also the, the transcript of protein from the Anopheles Gambia and Anopheles Phenostis as the evidence to uh, annotate the, the genes. Then secondly, we used the software, uh, um, the SNAP and Augusta to predict the genes as well. So, Finally, we combined the entire result and made the final annotation that um, we almost annotated 15,000 genes transcribing around 17,000 protein sequences. So that data is available in the, the dedicated web website that IWeb, uh, the uh, Dr. Subhat team created. So you can access our annotation information and also the new annotation information uh, by the NCBA NCBA, so they have that uh, the separate uh, link to uh, you know get access to this data. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, so, Mahul, I, I want to go back to something that you said and uh, put a little context to this. 
so all of our, you know, insect as well as vertebrate genomes are full of transposable elements. And I uh, just looked up the human information. About 45% of the human genome is transposable elements. So uh, there are a lot of these uh, that have uh, inserted themselves <clears throat> into genomes and they play an important part in the evolution of, of uh, species. So can you talk a little bit about the numerous TEs in the Anopheles uh, Stevens I genome? So, you know, what, what do you know about the nature and origin of them? What physiological effects? You talked about one uh, TE near the KDR gene in the three prime ETR. But in general, can you talk a little bit about the role of TEs in genome evolution and uh, phenotypic uh, variation? Yes, absolutely. Um, so in in so I'll I'll talk about a little bit about how T's are important in uh, phenotypic evolution and genome evolution, and much of what we know uh, come from uh, Drosophila, human, maize, these these organisms. The reason we don't know a uh, a lot about mosquito T's in mosquitoes is because. Uh, Strangely, the TEs have been uh, have not been studied that extensively for mosquitoes. Now, what we know from based on um, Drosophila work is that uh, TEs are mostly deleterious. So uh, the the genomes have evolved uh, mechanisms to suppress them, but still TEs find ways to um, avoid those silencing mechanisms. So there is a, a, a tug of war going on between the genome, the host, and the TE, which is like the parasite. And when we look at, uh, in, in, in our natural populations, the TEs are mostly unique in each individual. So the TEs that I will find in one mosquito or in one fly is uh, going to be not same as the TEs that I'm going to find in another individual mosquito or another individual fly. And that's because they're deleterious. So once they insert, the genome tries to, or the natural selection tries to remove them. So that you cannot, they rarely spread in the population until they are adaptive. Now, sometimes, in fact, a lot of times these are adaptive. And in, um, for example, um, I, I one example comes to mind is uh, the peppered moth example. And that's where that a TE inserted in a gene called cortex, and that is responsible for that melanic moth color, and made the moth uh, like adaptive and uh, or the uh, that color adaptive and spread in the population. So, yes, yeah, so TEs are often deleterious, but they can be adaptive and they can spread and they can affect the genome and the phenotypes in different ways. But unfortunately, we don't really know a lot about segregating T polymorph TTs in, in mosquito populations. And I, I, I hope and I, I really want the, that to change with starting with anophilus defense. So that uh, male specific TE that you, 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 you said there were some in the Y chromosome. Uh, have yes. Those, have those been seen before or is that, is that annotated in any way in the genome? Uh, that is, uh, so the only it has been found only in Drosophila melanogaster. And that was, I think last year, there was a paper on toxicity of male Y chromosome. And that pointed to Y chromosome TE expressions that were, uh, if you think, if, you, if, if we call it that way, harming the male genome, but not the female genome. And I think the situation is similar, something similar in going on in Anopheles defense. But I, I don't think anyone before this, uh, reported in any any other anopheles or any other mosquitoes about this. One of the questions from the audience is that uh, you know what, what did was this genome done using isofemale? So you might explain answer that and also explain how iso what isofemales are so that the audience uh, understands why it's important for the sequencing. Right. So. The isofemale lines are established by um, a wild caught single female. So you take a single female, you bring to the lab and let it breed. And from there you have um, two chromosomes of the female. And then you hope that the best case scenario is that there are other two chromosomes that from another male. And you have four chromosomes that are segregating in, in that um, 
what population you create from that isofemale line or population. Now, for genome assembly purposes, we want the genome to be uh, as uh, homogeneous or as homozygous as possible. So we want to isogenize, we want to reduce the variation. And for that, uh, we had to inhibit this, um, kind of, I mean, it, it, this is an isophenyl line, but this, again, it, this was um, inbred for five generations before it was sequenced so that we could minimize the heterozygosity in this, in this genome. So Arun, I'm going to go back yeah. to you. Uh, can you say something more about uh, the seven male linked uh, genes that you found at the Y chromosome? Uh, you know, why is the discovery of these genes important? What, uh, can you say something about the types of genes you found in particular? You talked a little bit about a transcription factor and why, what is the role of any of these genes in male mosquitoes? Yeah. Uh, yeah, the Y chromosome is very important, particularly for uh, many insect and the, the, uh, uh, the orthopods. Um, here, because the targeting the Y sequences uh, can be the basis for suppressing the uh, vector populations. So it can be anything, you know, mosquito or the ticks or any other vectors. Uh, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, we employed the, uh, the evidence-based as well as the de novo prediction uh, methodology to predict the uh, genes in the genome. So for the Y chromosome, uh, we have assembled 33 contigs. So that, you know, uh, comprises of 2.4 megabases. And here we predicted uh, 15 genes, but uh, seven of them are supported by the isoseq uh, data. That's uh, the long mRNA seq data. And we verified a couple of them uh, with the collaboration uh, with the, the Gitan lab and the Bakish does that work. And uh, also we identified uh, the uh, six of seven genes with the uh, you know, unknown function. So we couldn't be able to find out the function. So uh, computationally uh, that's required you know, further uh, analysis and the experimental work. But luckily, we found uh, the one gene based on the, the domain information. So we found the domain called MEDF uh, DNA binding domain. So based on that, we found this gene is uh, found to be involved in the male specific or uh, the transcription factor. And uh, currently that um, I'm expanding this work and, uh, you know, uh, recently I have assembled uh, around uh, five megabases of Y chromosome and we figured out uh, lots of new things and uh, we will be, uh, you know, I'm, I'm still doing that work and hopefully we will uh, figure out the function of many uh, new uh, Y chromosome genes in it. Uh, Mahul, uh, going to the insecticide resistance, uh, and the genes, I counted about 140 genes that you've identified, you know, the esterases, the glutathione as, as transferases, uh, and, and some of the other ones that you mentioned. So uh, one of the questions from the audience uh, from Dr. Tyagi is that, you know, uh, are there subsets of these genes involved in resistance to the four classes of insecticides uh, that uh, are commonly used? And uh, how do you go about Teasing that apart, uh, trying to see which of these genes are involved in insecticide resistance. Um, so, well, so one one I mean there are different ways to go go about it. Um, one is to look at other uh, mosquitoes or flies where the homologous genes have been uh, functionally characterized, and in fact the CYP six A fourteen I think in Drosophila protects from DDT, DDT. And so we can sort of guess that it might protect, for, pro provide resistance from DDT. Now, um, for other genes, we, we pro probably need to do like knockout or, or knockdown to, to check how, how these uh, genes are protecting from the insecticide uh, in this particular mosquito. And there is another work that is ongoing and I have not really touched on that at all. Um, uh, that is that when we look at the Anopheles stephens populations, we see distinct signals of adaptive evolution in some of these uh, insecticide-resistant gene clusters, which is suggesting that these regions have been involved in, in insecticide resistance. And we can correlate with 
what kind of insecticides have been used in those cities or in those areas. So yeah, so there are different ways we can go about it, like yeah, using using information that are already available or, or using experiments that we are going to do and people are already doing in ticks. Hmm. Uh, one other question from the audience is that, uh, you know, you've shown very beautifully that there are differences in insecticide resistance between females and, and males. And so the question is, do you observe the same kind of differences in the context of uh, either chemo reception or host seeking uh, behavior? And I know you characterized a lot of the olfactory receptors and so on, but I, I don't know that you've gone deep into the analysis, but maybe you have, uh, you can say either of you, if you've done something along those lines, you can just uh, uh, tell us where you are. Uh, I wish I could say a lot because we did the analysis, but uh, I, I don't remember off the top of my head what the results were. There were a bunch that showed differences. Um, I don't, Arun, do you remember? I don't. I don't remember uh, what the genes, but I can. I can take a look and I can get back, uh, like by <laughs> the email address. Yeah, just like, you know, so just in, in in their defense, these guys stared at about fifteen thousand genes and and try to classify them to families and so on. So I yeah. don't blame them for not remembering every detail of of, of their analysis at this point in time. Um, uh, so one of the things that you didn't talk about, but uh, I know, Arun, you have become very interested in this is that in the genome you found bacterial sequences so tell us a little bit about what you found why they're interesting and uh, uh, what you plan to do to follow up on some of these yeah this is very important question dr Suresh. um so before we scaffold the context into the chromosomes and i did the, the microbial uh, sequence the decontaminations so uh, I used a specific tool called the Kragen. So what that did that uh, we have identified around seven megabases of the, the microbial context and we have removed from the, the anaphylis sequencing genome. So unless otherwise, so if you, if you didn't do that analysis or excluding those microbial context from the uh, anaphylis genome, then probably it may uh, mislead the, the downstream results. So this is a kind of a key analysis I did. And also, uh, very interestingly, uh, we have assembled the, the Suratia marcescensis, the one of the gram-negative bacterium. We have assembled the, the first, the complete uh, circular genome of this bacterium from the Anaphilus sequence. So that is a genome uh, of the same um, strain uh, previously reported. Um, they have reported around 77 scaffolds for this bacterium uh, from the anaphylis sequence. So this is a, a important uh, key finding. And also we have assembled the, the circular, the, the complete genome of uh, Salmonella Fauci DNA virus as well. Apart from this, we could able to assemble the partial genome of different other bacterium like SSEA, micro, Microbacterium, Klebsiella, uh, Citrobacter, uh, pseudomonas and so other, uh, other species as well. But we could be able to only the partial genome of these uh, species. And we need to ask the questions as why uh, those are very important. So uh, typically people use the, uh, the microbiome analysis in uh, any vector. They uh, specifically choose the, the sickness RNA sequencing. So that will tell you that, uh, so what is present in the, um, in the particular uh, sample. But when you do the metagenomics, uh, you can able to figure out uh, what they do. That means that the, what the microbes uh, can do. So usually uh, referring the, the literature as well as uh, my previous experience with the CDC, there are microbes that have the, the endosymbiotic association with the vector population. So in the case of tick, there are many bacteria like Oxyella, Francisella, those are the bacteria having the endosymbiotic association with many ticks. In the case of mosquito, um, so Ceratia and Wolbachia, those are the, the dominant bacterial species that has the endosymbiotic association with the, the, the vectors. Uh, we will come up with the another question, so why those vectors require those microbes uh, in it. So because the most of this blood feeding arthropods 
they require the uh, the necessary nutrients. So usually it's get uh, some of the nutrients from the blood, but not the complete nutrition. Uh, it's get it from that. So for the remaining food, so it's entirely depending on the endosymbionts. So the endosymbiont has the genes that will synthesize the amino acids and the cofactor, and it you know is a kind of mutual uh, the um, the association is going on between the bacteria as well as the, the vectors. So the vectors is providing the space for the bacteria to live, and the bacteria is providing the necessary nutrition for the vector. So these are the key findings we did. Very interesting. So just to remind the audience, it is only the female mosquitoes that bite mm -hmm. uh, and that feed on blood. Uh, so uh, Mahul, going back to, you did an analysis of the blood inducible, blood meal inducible genes also. Were there uh, interesting things that you found in terms of uh, like insecticide resistance or some of these other properties where they induced uh, after uh, 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 blood meal? Yeah, there, there were, uh, there were um, uh, se several interesting things, um, but a um, couple of things that I can um, mention here. One was that uh, there were yellow genes that were uh, found to be upregulated after the blood meal. And the interesting thing is, is one of these yellow genes was targeted in a in a CRISPR experiment or I think in a gene drive experiment in Anopheles Gambi a couple of years back, and they showed that this was involved in like egg egg uh, cell membrane uh, formation and all. Um, and so this was it was nice to sort of uh, find the similar uh, function um, in in different side by by a different uh, path, and. Then there was uh, antimicrobial peptides that uh, Arun found uh, that we've, uh, we we found that were upregulated after the blood meal. So if you are trying to um, control the uh, the parasite entry somehow, you could, for example, use these body inducible promoters with these antimicrobial peptides. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. So that, but there are a lot more things. <laughs> These are the, like a couple of things that that comes to my mind right now. Yeah, um, uh, Mahul, I know you're also very interested in something you touched upon very briefly, and these are structural variants. So, can you tell us a little bit more about why you're interested in them and uh, some uh, teasers from the genome uh, about the presence of structural variants? Uh, yeah, particularly involving genes of interest like insecticide resistance, if you could say a little bit about that. Yeah, so uh, I, I, I'm, I'm super interested in uh, structural variation because uh, my, inter my research interest is understanding uh, patterns of genetic variation and what their consequences are um, on say, adaptation or uh, deleterious genetic variation. And Structural variations, because they change a big part of the genome compared to a single nucleotide uh, variants, they are more likely to um, affect a gene function um, either very close to them or even sometimes uh, far away from them. And precisely for this reason, for, for adaptation, especially for uh, adaptations when things have to happen very quickly or in a very short span of time, like something like evolving insecticide resistance, structural variants like gene duplications or TE insertions become extremely important. And there is uh, evidence of that in Drosophila. We have found this evidence in uh, Anopheles Gambi. Now we are seeing this in Anopheles Stephensi. And in fact, we are seeing this evidence in Indian population. So I'm not gonna divulge too much details because there are people working on that. And so uh, I'd say stay tuned for those things. And there are really, really interesting stuff going on, like uh, different uh, different structural variants, like different gene duplications and indels being involved in different cities in India in insecticide resistance. But those those are coming. I mean, those results are on the horizon. Yeah. Well, so that's a good good time to end on that note. I should just say that. 
uh, th these young scientists have done a fantastic job in not only getting this uh, assembly done, but uh, the analysis also. And as you can see, this has opened many doors, not only for the science and work being done at TIGS. Uh, we talked about uh, things like insecticide resistance genes, olfaction, uh, olfactory receptors, the microbiome, the structural variants, and so on. But I also hope, and this is the primary reason that TIGS exists, it is to help serve society. And so I hope that all of the people there in the audience, as well as your friends who are working on mosquito biology will get interested in the various aspects of this or pull in your friends from other fields uh, and, and ask them to work on uh, pests and, and, and uh, mosquitoes. Uh, so with that, I want to thank both Mahul and Arun for a really wonderful uh, talk and a discussion. And I want to thank you, the audience, for being uh, dedicated enough to uh, come and listen to the talk and uh, I wish you all a great day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Professor.